Good evening. Welcome to the Milliard Museum tonight and Manchester's Masters. We're so thrilled to have you all here tonight. It's going to be a really fun evening. My name is Jeff Barraclough. I'm the executive director of the Manchester Historic Association and the Milliard Museum. I'm just going to give a quick uh, introduction of, of who we are, for those of you who are not familiar, and then we will go ahead and, and get started. But this is a, a great partnership that we do, this event as well as um, others throughout the year with the Majestic Theatre. And uh, it's, it's going to be a fun time. Christy is going to give an explanation of how this is going to work in a, in a few minutes. But just real quick, the Manchester Historic Association, we operate the Milliard Museum here. We are an organization founded in 1896. Our mission is to collect, preserve, and share Manchester's history. We do that through a variety of ways through the Milliard Museum here, through our research center on Amherst Street, and through programs and events throughout the year like, like this one. So we are a member-based organization, member-supported. I know many of you are uh, members of our organization, so thank you for your continued support. If you are not a member, we would love to have you join us. Uh, see me or Christy afterwards, and we'd be happy to give you some more information about our membership and how you can uh, become a part of our organization. I'm going to introduce Karen to you now. Karen is with the Majestic Theatre and thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Karen Bissett. I'm the Development Director over at the Majestic Theatre. How many of you have been to the Majestic? Oh great, nice to see some hands. Um, we are celebrating our 33rd season. Um, we've got a great lineup. I did leave some of these postcards right up at the front table uh, or you can see me and I'd be happy to give you that. We do year-round theater productions with kids, teens, adults, and anytime we get to partner with the Milliard Museum and Manchester Historic, we always jump at it because it's so fun to bring history to life. So we have 10 wonderful actors for you tonight and um, I think that's it. I'll let Christy talk about the rules. The rules. <laughs> right. I'll just, I can stand next to you. We can. Okay. Um, so, welcome. My name is Christy Ellsworth. I'm the Director of Education at the Manchester Historic Association. Um, and we're so happy that you're here for another one of our actor-led events. Um, like Karen and Jeff said, we have 10 actors portraying famous artists from Manchester's past. Um, some pretty recent, like Bob Montana, and some from much further back, um, like Edward Cooster. And we're so excited to have you here. This is just a fun social event. Um, we want you to walk around, drink, be merry, um, socialize, interact with the actors. The actors are just that. They are actors. Um, so they are given a blurb about this big about somebody who lived a very full life. So if they don't tell you information you were really hoping for, um, please refrain from interrogating them. <laughs> um, they, they don't know, um, but myself or Jeff or one of our wonderful board members, if you are on the Manchester Historic Board, can you please raise your hand? Um, so please feel free to interrogate those lovely individuals. Um, but really, um, we can answer any questions that you have, but feel free to interact with them. Have a great time. Take pictures, please post them, please tag us and the Majestic Theater. Um, and that's all, the bar is open. Our handsome bartender, Kale, will help you out with anything you need. Please try our signature cocktail. We have snacks for you. Um, and every about five or six minutes, we are going to ring that really loud bell you heard. Can you ring it, Kale? No, I don't know what it's, it's right there. <laughs> That'll signify that it is time to move on. Um, it doesn't always work. In fact, it's like herding cats, so um, that's okay. But um, the, the actors will kind of do it on command, but we try to keep them not having to do it 25 times. Um, so every five or six minutes, we will ring that bell, um, and then you can just rotate through the stations, feeling free at any moment to come get a snack or a drink. You're not going to miss anything. Um, I do recommend that we sort of break across the, how do you, what do you think the best way to do this is, Jeff? Um, maybe just send, send people in, don't, don't have everyone go in the same direction. Yeah, yeah so, so kind so of just spread out if, and If you find see a big crowd around, so go, go so find enough, yeah. someone else. Yeah. And so. then we will start as soon as we ring the bell. So, go ahead. Yeah, and just one other thing to mention, one of, one of the, Thing, the ideas that inspired tonight's event is the fact that we have a special exhibit right now on Henry Herrick, who is one of the artists featured. So you will hear from Mr. Herrick himself in the doorway there. But uh, we have an exhibit all about his artwork that has been up for the last few months. Tonight is actually the last night that this exhibit will be open. We'll be um, opening a new exhibit 
next month. So uh, be sure to check out that exhibit tonight. It's the last ex opportunity to see um, all of the artwork that we have uh, of Henry Herrick. So. Yes, and a lot of the artwork on display has never been displayed from our collection before or it's been borrowed. Um, so definitely a cool opportunity to see stuff that we don't normally showcase. Although some of the things are in our permanent collection, a lot of the things came out just for tonight. Um, so please grab a drink, find a buddy, and um, go adventure out into the museum. I'll ring the bell to signify that the actor should start, and I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, I am Esther Elizabeth Africa, born in Manchester, New Hampshire, on January 21st, 1890. I'm the daughter of Walter G. and Maud C. Africa. I had three siblings, Dorothea, Maud Isabel, and Walter. Our family lived at 87 Harrison Street before moving to 764 Chestnut, where I would live along with my mother and sister Dorothea until my death in May of 1967. I was known as the family artist. Each year for 32 years, I would send a homemade card to acknowledge the wedding anniversary of my sister Maud Isabel and her husband Robert Red Rolfe. These creative cards were made from a variety of materials and included words of encouragement to the couple. The cards were often signed from Mama and the Girls. All 32 of these cards are in the collection of the Manchester Historical Association donated by my niece, Isabel Africa Rolfe. My father, Walter G. Africa, was a successful businessman and an active member of the community. He was superintendent and treasurer of the People's Gaslight Company, a director of Amoskeg National Bank, a trustee of the Masonic Home, president of the Chamber of Commerce, board chair of the YMCA, and a member of the Rotary, the Dairyfield Club, and the Odd Fellows. My sister Dorothea and I never married, and my sister Maud Isabel, who was just called Isabel, married New York Yankee third baseman Robert Red Rolfe and lived in Pennacook, New Hampshire. And my brother Walter and his wife Louise lived at 83 North Adams Street until they moved to Pennsylvania in 1941. My family is very important to me, and my yearly cards gave me an opportunity not only to express myself artistically, but also to show my love and thanks to those dearest to me. Good evening. My name is Omer T. Lasson, and I was born in 1903 Concord, New Hampshire, to French-Canadian immigrants. I went to school in both Manchester and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And during the 1920s, I studied both art and color with a master's in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Although my style has evolved over the past 60-year career, ranging from lifelike landscapes to modern abstract studies, I never lost my love of color, as you can see. I always considered myself a colorist at heart. My career took an unexpected turn in 1929. I had taken work as a portrait artist, and one of my subjects, New Hampshire Governor John G. Winnett, suggested that I go to the South Pacific to paint. I, I took John's advice and spent a year painting landscapes and the native life of West Samoa in 1930, a year which came to define my career as an artist. In 1934, I exhibited at the Grand Salon de Paris in Paris, France, and was elected to the Société des Artistes Français. During the years of the Great Depression, I was the administrator of the WPA Federal Arts Project. And from 1935 to 1942, I arranged exhibits of art all across New Hampshire. I met with many like-minded artists, and in 1940, I helped to find the New Hampshire Art Association and to exhibit and further the work of contemporary artists throughout the state. I met my dear wife, Louisa Tompkins, at a watercolor class. Louisa was a jewelry maker and a craftswoman, as well as the niece of James W. Hill. After Mr. Hill's death, Louisa and I inherited his home at 269 Hanover Street, right up the hill here. Immediately following Pearl Harbor, I joined the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and served at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard painting scenery for Army films and later painted scenes of Portsmouth. In the decades after World War II, I began to lead a charge of artists focusing on the modern art movement. 
While my subject matter and artistic style continue to change, my love for color has been unwavering. Always a colorist, my later work ranged from political satire to religiously inspired dramatic pieces. I died in Manchester in 1980 at the age of 77. And Louisa and I are buried at Pine Grove Cemetery here in Manchester. This is an original work of mine. It's called October in New Hampshire, which is quite accurate, if you ask me. And note the, the bright colors, the yellows and the oranges and the reds, and then the shadowy dark, suggesting that there's secrets in the forest. I'll sell it to you if you want to. Even the afterlife is expensive. <laughs> Thank you. So I am Ulysses Dow Tenney, one of the foremost 19th century portrait artists of New Hampshire. You'll find my work throughout New England at uh, the State House, New Hampshire State House, Yale University, Dartmouth College as well. I was born in 1826 in Hanover, New Hampshire, and died in 1908 in Portsmouth, so I was 82 years old. I studied first with my uncle, portrait artist Aidan Tenney, then with Roswell T. Smith of Hanover and Francis Alexander, who was a leading portrait artist of Boston. In 1849, I settled in Manchester, New Hampshire, and I worked in the area for 14 years, including two years in Hanover and two years in Concord, where I resided starting in 1866. In 1874, I painted hundreds of portraits of political leaders, government officials, clergymen, and educators in the cities of New Hampshire, chiefly Portsmouth, Manchester, Concord, and Hanover. My portraits hang at the New Hampshire State House, Dartmouth College, and Yale University, as well as public and private collections in Boston, Portsmouth, and Manchester. During my career, I taught a number of students in addition to painting nearly 1,000 portraits, notably those of President Franklin Pierce, Dartmouth College Presidents Asia D. Smith and Samuel C. Bartlett, and John Stark, which picture I painted here in 1894, which was, I was 68 years old. Now John Stark passed away in 1822. So I must have done this from either a picture or a lithograph or whatever. But um, so he was already deceased. When we he was deceased a good 40 plus years prior to that. Wow. But I think my guess is while I was younger, I would kind of be hobnobbing with the presidents and the college presidents and the President of the United States and the local politicians mm -hmm. and maybe as I got older I still had the talent but maybe I didn't want to put myself out there so I you know went back to Revolutionary War heroes but that is a picture that I did in 1894. I was born Henry W. Herrick on August 23rd 1824 in Hopkinton, Hopkinton, New Hampshire in this very house as a matter of fact. My father Israel was a merchant and lumber dealer and my mother Margaret Trow Herrick was an amateur painter who studied with Jedediah Morse. My mother recognized and encouraged my pursuit of art, and by the age of eight, I was painting flowers, birds, and other objects of nature with my mother's guidance. My career took me all over the country. As a teenager, I moved to Tennessee to find work as a portrait artist. And then in 1852, I moved to New York to begin teaching at an all-women's design school, the New York Academy of Design. I was an early advocate for equal employment uh, rights for women in the engraving profession. And in 1858, when the New York Academy of Design merged with the Cooper Institute, I left the school to concentrate on my own work as an engraver. During the Civil War, I was a lead engraver for Harper's Weekly. My proclaimed artwork spoke to a nation in peril, and my illustrations were said to have the wisdom of a much older man. In 1865, at the age of 41, and after a successful career as an art teacher and an engraver, I returned to Manchester to care for my aging mother. Despite Manchester's bustling industrial center, I was more drawn to the side streets and small farms on the outskirts of Manchester and chose to make those the focus of my later work. Ten years later, I was still living in Manchester, working as an engraver in both Boston and New York and perfecting a new technique watercolor. A trendy medium in the art world during this time, watercolor to allow me a more subtle way to engage the characters that I had been using in my engraving work. The characters I created from 
John Stark to everyday mill workers seldom sat idle. They were engaged in activities such as fighting and driving and hunting. My passion for the community and for art led me to volunteer at the First Congregational Church and to found the Manchester Art Association. I served as its second president from 1900 to 1904. I passed away in 1906 and left behind a legacy of high quality, truly expressive artwork. You can visit me at my place of rest at the Universalist Church Cemetery in Nashua, New Hampshire. Thank you. Are you guys ready to hear all about Bob Montana? Yeah. So I'm Bob Montana. I was the I'm the celebrated cartoonist of the Archie comics. I was born Bob Montana in California in 1920. I traveled to vaudeville houses in 48 states before the age of nine. I received my schooling backstage in theater dressing rooms, where I also learned about comedy and humor. By age seven, I knew that I wanted to be a cartoonist and started cartooning caricatures based on people I would encounter in my daily life. It was during my senior year in high school that I found myself in Manchester, New Hampshire, attending and graduating from Manchester Central High School in 1940. At the age of 21, I created Archie, based on the caricatures of my classmates in high school, for MLJ's Pep Comics December 1941 issue, illustrating a script by Vic Bloom. The success of the characters in Pep led MLJ to assign me to draw the first issue of Archie in 1942. Archie was, however, put on hold during World War II when I spent four years working in the Army Sign Corps, drawing coded maps and working on training films with fellow cartoonists Sean Cobain and Charles Adams. Before entering the Army Sign Corps, I also drew other cartoons, which included Danny in Wonderland, Inspector Bentley, Lunar, and Spark Stevens, and created cover art during World War II for Pep Zip, Top Notch, and Jackpot where I frequently depicted superheroes such as the Shield, Steel Sterling, and the Black Hood battling the Japanese and Nazi soldiers. After the war, I returned to work day drawing the daily and Sunday strips for 700 newspapers until I died of a heart attack while cross-country skiing in Meredith, New Hampshire in 1975, where the statue is. Right? Over the years, the Archie comics have been adapted to conform with the changing times. My original characters remain the core of the series, but we have also been introduced to a handful of new characters. Despite these changes and my death, the Archie Comics series still continues today. The Archie Comics have also been adapted into other forms of media. In 1943 through 1953, a radio show called Archie Andrews began, which depicted my characters and their adventures. On May 6, 1990, NBC showed a TV movie called Archie to Riverdale and back again, which was subsequently turned into a comic book that depicted the characters as adults 15 years after their high school graduation. Other variations of the comic have been created, such as the Little Archie stories, which depict, depict Archie in his early years. Blogs, online computer games, and merchandise also continue to be popular in today's times. According to Archie publisher Michael Silbercleet, the official Archie website gets 40 million hits a month. My legacy lives on.
I didn't realize that's how he died. Right. This is young. 55, yeah. I am Maude Briggs Knowlton and I lived from 1870 to 1956. I am an American watercolorist, still life painter, art instructor, craft person, printmaker, and museum administrator. As an artist, my specialty was flowers and landscapes. A lifelong Manchester resident and a graduate from Manchester Central High School. My friend Alice Sweat and I were the first two women artists in the famous Monhegan Island Artist Colony. I was a pupil of Rhonda Holmes Nichols in New York and studied in Holland and Paris. I was a member of the Copley Society in 1900, Boston Essay Crafts, now the Society of Arts and Crafts, and the New Hampshire League of Arts and Crafts. Perhaps one of my biggest accomplishments was serving as the first director of the Courier Museum of Arts from 1929 to 1946, and one of the first women to be a museum administrator in the United States. At the time of its opening, the museum, then called the Courier Art Gallery, had neither a collection large enough to fill the gallery, nor an acquisition policy to guide the development of the collections. I wisely arranged a series of notable loan exhibitions from private and commercial sources until the trustees and I determined how best to proceed. I am noted for saying, one good canvas is worth a whole gallery of undistinguished paintings. I am Lucen H. Goslin, and I was born in Wakefield, New Hampshire. My father was of French ancestry who first settled in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and then New Hampshire. My mother came from a family of sculptors. The best among them known was Philip Herbert of Montreal, whose monuments are known in that city and the provinces of Quebec and Ontario. As a small boy, I attended St. Augustine's Academy. And by 1909, without <clears throat> ever taking a single lesson, I had completed a bust of Napoleon Bonifar. My second was that of my uncle, Philip Herbert. And my third was a statuette of Abraham Lincoln. In 1911, I enrolled in L'Academia Julien in Paris, France, where I studied for two years winning a gold medal in competition. I returned to Manchester in 1916 and opened a studio, executing numerous statues and medallions of prominent Franco-American, Americans throughout New England and New York. Among the outstanding monuments in Manchester that I have completed include the World War Memorial in Victory Park, Sweeney Memorial, Jutra's Post Memorial, the Pulowski Memorial, the Joseph P. Chattel Memorial at St. Augustine Cemetery, the marble statues at St. Joseph's Chapel, the Alfred J. Cretine Memorial, and the T.J. Lebrecht Memorial at Mount Calvary Cemetery, and bust of Bishop Girton, Dr. Augustine Bryan, and Franklin Pierce. I also executed large panels of relief and plaques among them, St. Joseph's Grammar School, St. Anthony's School, soldiers killed in World War I, members of the ACA, and Reverend Louis Ramsey, chaplain of Jutra's Post. But alas, my greatest works were never to be because funding fell short. One was a $50,000 war memorial to Joan of Arc in Lafayette Park, opposite of St. Marie Church. And facing the city, it was to measure 72 feet in length at the base. There were to be seven steps to the first platform. There would be a floor 11 feet deep, the entirety of all 72 feet of the platform. The floor then leads to a second series of steps, numbering 14, broken in the center by a high pedestal, 16 feet high. On top of this, 
was gonna be an Esquerian statue of Joan of Arc in bronze, 18 feet high from the base to the top of the helmet. The sword was gonna raise another foot above that. In all, the monument was to be 42 feet tall. There were to be numerous plaques throughout the memorial and there was gonna be an American eagle surmounting the front and a fountain. My second work that never came to be was a colossal eagle on top of rock rimmin. This was to measure 10 feet in diameter on top of a pedestal 20 feet high. The eagle itself would measure 12 feet from its claws to its bill. The ego outstretched wings would be 18 feet from to the tips. The great bird passes above a series of esplanades and stairs approaching it and would be visible for miles when illuminated at night. It was my honor to create a legacy for myself, paying tribute to these important people here in the city I love through my art. Good evening, Edward L. Kuster here, born January 24th, 1837 in Basel, Switzerland. In 1846, I came to the United States with my family, where we lived in Syracuse, New York. We later moved to Manchester, New Hampshire, so that my father could study to become a doctor. In my early years, I worked as a decorative painter, making signs and advertisements for local Manchester businesses. At the age of 23, I traveled to Germany to study painting, focusing on the beauty of nature and fine-tuning my ability to translate it onto canvas. When I returned to Manchester in 1862, I established myself a very lucrative career as a fine artist. Setting up a studio in Boston, Massachusetts, I worked full-time as a portrait artist. Dignitaries and prominent citizens traveled from all corners to have their portraits done by me. My subjects marveled at both my attention to detail as well as my ability to capture their personality. My many subjects included future governors of New Hampshire, Frederick Smith, Moody Courier, and Port, uh, Person Cheney. I also painted women and children with a focus on their soft and delicate features. I married my childhood sweetheart, Ruth Porter. Ruth and I so enjoyed life in Boston, while maintaining close connections with our friends and family still here in Manchester. We took several trips to Germany so that I could continue to improve my art. But sadly, my Ruth died in 1878 from a long battle with tuberculosis. In 1879, I journeyed to Europe once more, where I met and married my second wife, Mary McClure of Cambridge, Massachusetts. I died suddenly in early January 1881 at the age of 80, uh, 44 and subsequently was buried in Valley Cemetery here in Manchester. It is said that my friends and family were, quote, shocked by the sudden loss of a true friend and a vibrant individual. And my obituary in the Boston Evening Transcript stated, quote, to his friends, Mr. Cooster was more than the popular and successful painter. He was a man to be esteemed as a friend, to be loved. He was as simple as truth itself prone to no artifice, vanity, or envy. There are many homes where he will be missed like a brother. It is difficult to realize that we are no more to see his face, nor feel again the grasp of his honest hand." Very touching and humbling words. So my featured art piece this evening is this portrait of my sister, Lena. Her name was Carolyn Kuster, and we call her Lena. She was born in 1843 in Switzerland, and she was employed as a music teacher. She married Sebastian Christoph from Germany in 1882. They had two children, Elizabeth and Emil. Emil was named after our father. And she passed away Christmas Day in 1919 at the age of 79. And she's now buried in Pine Grove Cemetery.